Hello. Test. Yeah. Good evening. Uh, we're sorry for the delay. This was uh, beyond our control. I will um, explain what we're going to do tonight and uh, give you the plan, and then we'll go forward with the program. Uh, we're really open to questions or comments if you have them, and we hope we can have a debate at the end of the first part before we do show performance. So, uh, just to explain some facts, my name is Alexi Monroe, I'm the editor of this book, State of Emergence, and I've been writing about the Slovene group Neue Slovenia Kunst for more than 15 years now. Uh, I published a book with MIT Press called Interrogation Machine in 2005. Uh, I was also the organiser of the first Congress of NSK citizens. And for those of you who don't know, the NSK state exists as a virtual state with no territory. There are now more than 14,000 citizens. Alexander Lim, who you'll see shortly, and myself, we hold diplomatic passports to the NSK state. We're not members of Neue Slovenische Kunst, but we are diplomats of the NSK state. And what's been happening in the last uh, two years or so is that the NSK citizens are organising themselves. They're not waiting for the NSK artists to, to stage an event. They're organising their own autonomous events in London, Leipzig, New York, Lyon, other places. And this is a growing movement. And it's a movement which is about uh, challenging the existing state borders and the existing state mentality. And it's also a very interesting example of European culture, which we'll discuss later. But first of all, I want to um, briefly explain who Alexander is. He is from the uh, NSK Lips group. Lips is a Sorbian word for Leipzig. Leipzig means Germany has a small Slavic population called Sorbs. So when they decided to form a group there, they created it as NSK Stadt Lipsk, which you can see on the logo there. And he will be presenting on behalf of the Lips group, who've already staged one exhibition and have some interesting projects prepared. What I want to do first of all is to read from this book from State of Emergence. And the first text is by Ada Chufa, who's a woman who was involved in setting up the NSK state. And this is to explain the basic facts of NSK. For those, who are not, for those of you who are not familiar. So. First of all, a quote from Antonin Artaud. The theatre, which is in no thing, but makes use of everything, gestures, sounds, words, screams, light, darkness, rediscovers itself at precisely the point where the mind requires a language to express its manifestations. To break through language in order to teach life is to create or recreate the theatre. Uh, te that text is Antonin Artaud's The Theatre and its Dark Writers. The next two stages, the transformation of Neue Slovenische Kunst into the NSK state in time in 1992, and the subsequent self-organised activity of NSK citizens in the first decade of the new millennium, which culminated in the first NSK Citizens Congress in Berlin, have received comparatively little critical examination. So the focus here is on the NSK state, its historic context, its possible meanings and its future potentials. So the NSK state emerged from the eclipse of two other states. The decline of socialist Yugoslavia, of which all NSK members were born citizens, by the end of the 1980s, and the subsequent inauguration in 1991 of the independent democratic state of Slovenia, which is one of the six former Yugoslav republics to which the majority of NSK members ethnically belong. These events were part of a larger historic breakdown of the socialist states in Eastern Europe, which for most of the 20th century represented an alternative to the monopoly capitalism of the so-called First World. The relevance and meaning of the NSK state 
as determined by the activity of NSCO citizens, is therefore as contingent upon and open to interpretation as the meanings and directions taken by the world at large after 1989. The emergence of the NSK state in the 1990s had its conceptual heritage in the NSK art movement of the 1980s, which is to say, among other things, that it wasn't looking to provide unambiguous answers or definitive readings, but rather to itself function as a question, as Slavoj Žižek has posted, or as an interrogation machine, as I say in my book. It transferred the entire responsibility for the production of meaning and message to the reader or the spectator. While the ideal NSK witness was expected to strongly react to the audiovisual and linguistic materials that were offered for cultural consumption, and to produce the meaning of her or his experience through emotional and intellectual struggle, we as NSK members had to accept and strictly obey Leibach's core principles of, quote, conscious rejection of personal taste, judgment, conviction, and free depersonalization. In other words, they were doing something that's now known as over-identification. They were choosing to submerge their own personal identities into a larger collective structure. NSK consciously eclipsed the subjectivity of the author with the object of creation giving up control over the final form, expression, or intention of the so-called artwork, while in return achieving access to realms of historic uncertainty where the actual NSK artworks were formed and formed. So it's actually, it's a really unique artistic project because it's crossed over so extensively into real life. As I said, there are 14,000 NSK citizens now, it's a growing movement, there was the Congress in Berlin. So it's very, um, very much a lived culture. It's a virtual state, it doesn't have any physical territory, but there is a lived culture forming around it. And there have also been many uh, strange incidents and events in history. One interesting story is 1995, the whole of the NSK movement went to Sarajevo right at the end of the war. And they took over the National Theatre in Sarajevo. And they said that this was NSK state territory. So here is this Slovene group coming to Sarajevo right at the end of the war, taking over the National Theatre. So there's an exhibition, there are concerts by Leibach, and there's also uh, issuing of NSK passports. And during the events they issued, uh, I think, more than 200 passports. And these are diplomatic passports, and we can show you these passports later. And some people from Sarajevo were able to use these passports to get out of Sarajevo. And at that time, if you were from Sarajevo, the Bosnian passport had no value, you couldn't travel. But when the border guards, when the NATO guards, saw these diplomatic passports, they were confused and they thought, okay, maybe uh, there are lots of new East European states now, it says diplomatic. Uh, I don't really want to, to try and stop this person in case he's really a diplomat. Uh, could be a big incident, could be a big scandal, so okay, off you go. And many people have used these passports to travel. Um, more recently, it becomes much stranger because people in Nigeria somehow get to hear about the NSK state. And people in Algeria, criminals, actually start telling people, we can sell you an NSK passport for much more than it costs, maybe $200. And if you get this passport, you can live in Europe. You can live in Slovenia. So there's this criminal deception going on. But it's because they've heard the real stories of the people living in Sarajevo or crossing other borders. And uh, the result of this was that NSK members went in 2010 to Lagos in Nigeria and they tried to explain and they tried to say this is an artistic project, it's a virtual conceptual project uh, it doesn't give you the right to live in Slovenia, it doesn't give you the right to travel in the EU it's not what you want it to be so the Nigerian audience listens to this and they seem to understand everything is fine, ah oh, yes, artistic project, that's fine so, there are two reactions. The first reaction is, okay, 
Now we understand this is not real, but we would like to help to make it real. <laughs> so they, we received some, some emails and they were saying, ah, I'm, I'm a professional footballer, or um, I'm an uh, expert in agriculture, and I want to help build the site. Which in, in a way is a very literal uh, interpretation of the site, which no one expected, the artist didn't expect this. And then the other really interesting action, reaction came at the end because they, they finished their presentation and then somebody puts their hand up at the end. And he, he turns to the Nigerians, he doesn't address the artists. He said, no, no, don't listen to them. My friend has been to NSK, it's a beautiful country. I am lying. So, on the, on the one hand, this may be because of criminal motives, because they want to keep the deception going. But also, it's, it's become like a kind of utopian religious belief. And it's, it's taken more seriously there than the artists take it. And this also happens with another phenomenon, because when the NSK Lips group was created last year, they had their first exhibition. And the concept that they chose was, it's a beautiful country precisely from this Nigerian misunderstanding. So they invited people to, again, not the NSK artists, but NSK citizens, they invited them to send photos of NSK landscapes. So people chose uh, photos of ideal landscapes, uh, Scottish hills, or Algerian deserts, or cityscapes, and they exhibited uh, 20 or 30 of these images and they had um, an NSK consulate. So if you wanted to come in to the exhibition, you had to either show your NSK passport and get a stamp, or you would pay for a temporary visa. You would pay two euro to get this temporary visa, which would also be stamped. And this is a good example of how NSK introduces this play into the heart of the state. So all the, all the oppressive, bureaucratic uh, systems that we're subject to, they actually turn against themselves and do it in a really playful, interesting way. And what has happened in Leipzig and elsewhere is that the citizens have done this without the artists, and this is growing the culture. And Alex will tell you more about this later, but uh, next year there will actually be the first NSK folk art Biennale. And I should explain what folk art is. NSK folk art is the art produced by NSK citizens, not by Neuslandische Kunst. So it's not paintings by Erwin, it's not music by Leibach, it's not Scipio Nasich at the theatre group, it's not the Department of Philosophy. It's a movement by the citizens to produce their own artworks expressing their, their interest in NSK symbolism. And then continuing this work of cultural reprocessing, which began in the 1980s in Slovenia. And on the one hand, it's very, very specific. They use lots of Slovenian symbols, which nobody outside Slovenia had seen before, really. It's the first time that Slovenian culture has been exported. And what's especially interesting is that now, because of the, the fascination with this, you get people coming from Germany and from Austria who are interested in the art to learn the Slovenian language and to understand Slovenian culture. And you have to remember that the, the Slovenes were very, very heavily assimilated by the Austrians. And they saw them as a Vindish, they saw them as a, a lost German tribe who could be made German again. And Hitler came to Maribor in 1941 after the invasion, and he said, make this land German for me. So the Slovenes and the Germans were always this lost tribe that they wanted to bring back, they wanted to Germanize them. And that's what Leibach and NSK are playing with by using the German language. It's a very uh, rich and traumatic way of producing art. And they did this because they wanted to create something which wasn't... They didn't want to be dissidents. They didn't want to have the pathetic people of uh, position of we are against the state. They didn't want to uh, you know, be meeting in underground rooms. They didn't want to have a small scale existence. They were ambitious. And what they began to do by using state imagery, by using imagery from World War II, by using imagery from totalitarianism, they actually began to dwarf the state in Yugoslavia. 
So some of the, the actual artwork and the projects that they proposed were more monumental than the actual state could produce. And they caused one of the, the last great uh, scandals in Yugoslavia in 1987, there was the annual uh, Day of Youth Festival, when people would arrive from all over Yugoslavia with a baton and they would express their loyalty to Tito, even after he was dead. In 1987, NSK designed a poster for this event, and it was chosen as the best representation of socialist youth in Yugoslavia. Then the story is that two days later, an engineer in Belgrade saw the image and he recognised it. He recognised it from a British history book about World War II, because it was based on an allegory of the Third Reich by the Nazi artist Richard Klein from 1937. And it's a very monumental, heroic figure like this. And what they did, they replaced the Nazi symbolism with Slovene and Yugoslav symbolism. And they don't tell anyone. And the Yugoslav officials choose that as the best symbolic representation of Yugoslavia's socialist youth. So when the, when the news of this breaks, there's a colossal scandal. That there are maybe several hundred articles published all across Yugoslavia. The members are put under surveillance, they're questioned by magistrates, but they're never charged in the end because the Slovene liberal authorities didn't want to prosecute them. And also because if you put them on trial, what do you charge them with? And what would happen if, if that was openly discussed that the state officials had chosen this image to represent Yugoslavia? It, it's completely embarrassing and impossible situation for them. So, after that, the, the day of youth event was never held again, actually not to destroy that. So, of all the uh, activist art movements in the 1980s and beyond, it's the one which has had the most impact in Slovenia first, in Yugoslavia, but also now much wider, even in Nigeria, in America. So, so many people's lives have been changed by this. And the value of it is that there's no... They use totalitarian symbolism, so you expect that there will be some program or some orders or some manifesto. But there isn't. There's only your own interpretation. And the NSK space. And the NSK state is this utopian space that people choose to identify with. And they choose to bear a passport. And some people who are um, unhappy with their existing state identity, whether their existing national identity, maybe they're minorities or maybe they're ambivalent about their own state. They are patriotic about the NSK state. They see NSK as their real state identity. The other identity, if it's British or German, that's, that's just a functional, imposed identity. But this is a chosen identity, and this, this is really a positive aspect.